and welcome to this week's webinar, Advocating for Integration of Palliative Care and National COVID-19 Responses. This webinar is being recorded and will be available shortly after completion. My name is Claire Morris. I'm the Global Advocacy Director of the Worldwide Hospice Palliative Care Alliance, and I will be moderating today's uh, webinar. This webinar is number 12 of a series of 14 in a project on palliative care and COVID-19 developed jointly by the International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care, the International Children's Palliative Care Network, Palliative Care in Humanitarian Aid Situations and Emergencies, and the Worldwide Hospice and Palliative Care Alliance. The objective of the series is to provide globally relevant information and guidance to civil society and UN organizations policymakers, administrators, and healthcare providers on palliative care in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. The webinars are accompanied by briefing notes written by experts from around the world. These briefing notes are available in the globalpalliativecare.org website, and the web webinars are uploaded in the WHPCA website. We are very grateful to the contributors of the series and to today's presenters for accepting our invitation to participate in this collaborative project. This webinar will feature five 10 minute presentations with time at the end for question and answers. We will also have comments from Susanna Shirucci, who will share some reflections on today's topics. You can submit your questions through the chat box and Kate Jackson from the WHPCA will be condensing and reading them to the speakers. We will need to be quite strict with time as we have more speakers than usual for this particular webinar. And we want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to speak and we have enough time for questions at the end. So I'm delighted to introduce the first speaker, which is uh, Catherine Pet Petters, who is the Advocacy Officer of the International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care. And she will provide a summary of the briefing note entitled Advocating for Integration of Palliative Care into National COVID-19 Responses. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you, Claire. And hello, everybody. As Claire said, I'm the Advocacy Officer for IHPC, and I'm going to explain the briefing note, which we really hope you'll download from the Global Palliative Care website, because it's got all the links to the resources that I'm going to be talking about this morning. Next slide, please. So the issue that I'm gonna be talking about, next slide, please. Thank you. The issue I'm gonna be talking about is the fact that national palliative care associations need support and guidance to hold their policymakers accountable for commitments made at the international level to integrate palliative care into COVID-19 response plans and universal health coverage strategies. And the background to this is that UN member states, next slide please, Stephen, sorry. The background is that your countries have committed their governments to including palliative care into national COVID-19 responses. Yes, they have, and into primary health care and into universal health coverage schemes. And they've done this through resolutions and high level political declarations. However, as we know, uptake of these commitments is very slow or non-existent in many countries because the focus is on prevention, treatment, vaccines, and governments free ride on palliative care organizations that then bear the costs of service delivery. But the keys to change are to become an informed advocate even in the midst of a pandemic because we see this as an opportunity to officially build back better, to show our governments that palliative care is indispensable and in fact an essential part of the spectrum of essential services. Next slide, please, Stephen. Key facts are that the international palliative care organizations have extensive resources, some of which I'll point to, and advocacy experience. The World Health Organization, which many of your countries look to for guidance, has published three key documents regarding national COVID-19 response that include recommendations for integration of palliative care. These are very accessible, easy to read, and they also contain an essential package of medicines and services. And those are the operational planning guidance, 
the Temporary Guidance for Clinical Management of COVID-19, and the World Health Assembly Resolution 73-1 passed in May on national response. And as I said, the links to all those are in the briefing note. Please familiarize yourself with the palliative care sections so you can develop your advocacy messages. And here are some of the covers of these documents that I was just talking about, including in the top right-hand corner, you'll see the resources relevant to palliative care and COVID-19 on the Global Palliative Care website, which has all the live links. Bottom right-hand corner is the INCB press release, which gives uh, governments the directive to make palliative care medicines available to all who need them during the pandemic. Next slide, please. So one key distinction that I'm gonna to make today is between advocacy and lobbying, since this has been brought up in a few of the other webinars. Health advocacy includes educating policymakers and the public about evidence-based policy. So the two key words there are advocating, I mean, sorry, educating and evidence. Whereas lobbying includes attempts to influence, that's the key word, and legislative body or legislation, or that you would try to influence a government official who participates in formulating legislation. And international civil society organizations such as ourselves are prohibited from lobbying in your countries, whereas your national associations may be able to do that depending on your national legislation. You can always advocate and we will always be here to support you with that. Next slide, please, Stephen. So the current status of palliative care in COVID is unfortunately that palliative care literacy among policymakers, the media and the public still remains low to non-existent despite decades of international advocacy and as most of you know, community palliative care and national professional associations are struggling to survive financially and few, if any, have government funds. Many government offices are closed or under restriction, meaning you can't have your regular face-to-face -face meetings and palliative care providers are being deployed often to other services, often without adequate PPE. And another thing that's very stressful is that the pandemic is disrupting regular diagnostic treatment and palliative care services in most countries, causing distress and serious health-related suffering to affected patients and families with palliative care needs pre-pandemic. So that means that palliative care messaging is often drowned out in the current pandemic environment but we suggest that you use this opportunity, never waste a good crisis, and if not now, then when? And that's why we're here to help you with this. Next slide, please, Stephen. So we've developed some recommendations for you, which you can look at in more detail in the briefing note, but the first one is to designate at least one advocacy point person in your organization to review all the information and evidence and start making the connections and relationships you need to do good advocacy. The second, to familiarize yourself with existing COVID palliative care resources on the web pages that are linked, as I said, in the briefing notes and apply them to your national context. Refer to the WHO and INCB guidelines. INCB, I'll remind you, International Narcotics Control Board, which has to do with controlled medicines, and they have a lot of details on making medicines available. Third, identify key public health policymakers at all levels. So that's from your clinic all the way up to heads of state, members of parliament, people who make policy, and design informed advocacy efforts for appropriate engagement with each of them. Fourth, identify and develop relationships with opinion leaders and journalists um, and invite them with policymakers to accompany teams on home telemedicine and clinic visits as appropriate so they can see what you do and it's not just an abstract concept. They'll see that added value of palliative care. 
and then build a social media presence and collaborate with communications experts. And we will help with that too. Next slide, please. Uh, second recommendations, clarify your advocacy messages. And I'm not gonna read all these because you can read them in the briefing note, but can you develop an inventory of available services and train providers? Know what you can do. Um, are you prepared to deliver basic palliative care training online and in person to the national health workforce if you're called upon to do that, including community health volunteers? Pallium India has been doing that and they have a handbook now for that. And I know that Sipi is going to be talking about that too. But you may need a budget line and regulations for that. And that's where you start liaison with the government. And we, the international organization, I mean, can you support critical palliative care providers by facilitating difficult conversations with patients and providing bereavement care for families? So those are all suggestions of things that you might be able to do and that you can suggest to your policymakers that you could do. Next slide, please. So then the main thing is to increase your visibility. So join other national networks, for instance, for UHC, rights of older persons, persons with disabilities, identify allies among local NGOs, including HIV+, NCD patient groups, and very important faith-based organizations. Because then you could offer to advocate for patients with palliative care needs persons with disabilities and older persons in clinical situations where they may have no one else to advocate for them and you know how to do this. And again, you're showing the added value of palliative care. Regularly evaluate challenges and accomplishments, stop doing what doesn't work, and try new tactics in consultation with all direct stakeholders. So last but not least, learn and practice regular self-care and very important care for the team because you can't do things well if you don't feel well we all know that and COVID is taking a huge bite out of out of people's health it's causing a lot of burnout and we really recommend self-care for you and the team so last slide please thank you for attending this webinar Please read our briefing note, join our organization so you can get all our emails and, and vital communications, get in touch with us, ask questions, and be prepared for the long haul. This is a marathon, it's not a sprint. And as Peter Drucker said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And that's what we're doing together, and we're here to help you do today. So thanks very much for allowing me to participate in this webinar. And we are just delighted to have a great lineup. Thanks, Claire. Thanks so much, Catherine, um, not just for coordinating the briefing note on this um, webinar, but also your tireless and relentless work advocating for palliative care, not just as part of the COVID response, but over many years. Um, so we're now going to move on to our next speaker, who um, I'm delighted to uh, introduce, Rob Yates who is the Director of the Global Health Programme and Executive Director for the Centre of Universal um, Health at Chatham House in the UK. And he will be speaking on integrating palliative care into universal health coverage in the COVID-19 context. Thanks, Rob. Great, thank you very much, Karen. And thank you, Catherine, for a rousing introduction. And I'll be building on a lot of what you've just been saying there. Um, so, as Claire's mentioned, I, I am the executive, uh, executive director of the Centre for Universal Health at Chatham House, and, and uh, I'm a political health economist, um, very much sort of thinking along the lines that, that health and health reforms are as much political as they are anything to do with technical issues. And, uh, and I think we can very much see that in this extraordinary world in which we're living in at the moment with, with COVID-19, that so many of the health issues that we're dealing with are highly political in nature. You know, who gets the extra services? Who gets the money? Um, where, where is the balance of health reforms going forward, both uh, at a domestic level and an international level as well? And I think, you know, that um, Catherine mentioned this expression that you're hearing a, uh, mentioned a lot at the moment, you know, never waste a good crisis. 
Um, actually, I think that's been attributed to Winston Churchill, although I, I believe actually the, 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 uh, the quote actually came from President Obama's uh, advisor. Uh, but it's a very, I think it really does sum up where we are at the moment about, yes, these are very, very difficult times. And, and I'm sure colleagues are going to be explaining how difficult it is to provide palliative care services at the moment with services so, being so stretched. But in many respects, this does represent a great opportunity for, for, for us, you know, to, to bring about radical change. And across all sectors, people are talking about building back better, changing the way that we work, changing our priorities. And I think this is the way that we should be uh, addressing this at the moment, particularly within what we're calling universal health coverage reforms. Because as Catherine's mentioned, uh, just last September, all the heads of state of the world agreed that they were going to make faster progress to universal health coverage, where everyone gets the health services they need without uh, suffering financial hardship. And it's been a well-fought battle to include explicitly palliative care in the package of uh, UHC services. So you see all the references these days to UHC meaning promotion, prevention, curative, rehabilitative and palliative care. So it's right up there now amongst the, the sort of the categories of services that should be covered. But everyone recognises that there are uh, areas that are, are neglected. And I think, you know, this is the opportunity to hold world leaders to account to make sure that the full spectrum of services are covered within UHC packages. And I think it has been the case, if we were being honest, that the, the focus historically has been on curative services and in particular curative hospital services. That, you know, there has been an association of UHC and health coverage with people being sort of covered against inpatient hospital care and, and, and sort of getting curative services. And you might say at either ends of the spectrum in, in terms of promotion and prevention, but also palliative care, that being relatively neglected. And this is what it's all about now. I think that changing that discourse and holding leaders to account to make sure that absolutely everything is covered. And what this is going to require, I think, is a, a mixture of advocacy and education and using evidence, um, you know, which we're, we're all very adept at doing. But I would say much more explicitly, lobbying, you know, really getting stuck into the, into the politics, uh, because these are going to be political battles. Um, but I do, th I am an optimist and I, I think that with every single world leader at the moment under tremendous pressure to improve access to healthcare for their people and also protect people against financial hardship associated with health, you know, having to spend lots of money on, on expensive treatments and, and, you know, but that also being having to care for people uh, in the, the end of life care and also uh, funeral costs. All these things are weighing on the minds of, of households across the world. And through the political process, politicians are, are knowing that they really have to deliver on this now. So what you're seeing is that um, even in the midst of this crisis, you are seeing universal health coverage reforms being accelerated. And there's a real precedent for this. It, it, it's interesting that if you look back in history at the transitions to what we call UHC, so many of them have actually come out of crises um, where politicians have needed to respond to the urgency that the, the crisis presented their population. And have put a lot of public financing, and I emphasize public financing, into their health systems to cover everyone. Um, the country which I'm speaking from, the United Kingdom, did this at the end of the Second World War, when we were basically bankrupt and, and dependent on US aid, and the incoming Labour government in, in 1945 brought in the National Health Services. Japan did the same thing, J uh, France did the same thing. Uh, the Sri Lankan health system emerged out of a malaria epidemic in the 1930s. 
Um, in Thailand, their, their very successful UHC reforms came out of the Asian financial crisis of, of 99. Um, the, the Rwandan health reforms followed the genocide. So you can see that, that there is a real history of leaders acting on health and putting a lot of money into their health sector emerging out of crises. And here we are now in, in you know, the biggest health crisis to hit the world in, in over a century. And already we're seeing this. In, in Ireland, for example, the, the government um, have introduced lots of free GP services. Um, they've been buying up capacity in the private sector to, to equalize the, the health system there to make sure that everyone gets access to good services. Um, in countries like South Africa, where the hospice movement is, is very strong, there's a very strong palliative care movement in South Africa, you can see that the president is doing very well in this crisis and has made pledges to accelerate UHC reforms coming out of the crisis to make sure that there's an equitable health system that benefits all South Africans and not just the wealthy. So it's in these environments where you have got these rapid changes and potentially you've got big injections of public financing that we're going to have the best opportunity, I would say, to fight for more resources. And what we're doing at Chatham House, and we're very keen to work with the palliative care community, is that where these reforms may be happening to make sure that palliative care gets a decent slice of the cake. And countries that we're watching in this respect are uh, Kenya, where Zippy will be talking to us from, and also Ghana, South Africa. Bangladesh, I think, has got great opportunity to race ahead on UHC reforms. So do please keep in touch with us. And, and you know, that if you are planning your advocacy and lobbying campaigns and, and you want some support in these situations, do please get in touch with us and we'll be delighted to help you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Rob, and thanks as ever for your offer to support, which I'm sure we will be taking you up on. I know that there is advocates from Bangladesh and South Africa um, on the on the webinar. So thank you. Um, I think we all heard very clearly the importance of this um, as a political moment and the importance of us working to hold our world leaders to account. Um, um, but also to acknowledge that never wasting a good crisis is also a risk as well as an opportunity because we're not the only people who are trying to uh, make use of the crisis and uh, not make use of the crisis but there will be other people whose um, intentions may not be um, necessarily for the good of people's health so I think we need to keep be aware of that as well so thanks Rob we're now going to move on to our next speaker I'm pleased to introduce Natalie Greaves, who is a lecturer in public health and program coordinator um, at the West Indies University, who will be speaking on palliative care advocacy in the era of COVID-19, a health systems approach. Thank you. So thanks very much, Claire, for that introduction. And good morning for me, at least it's good morning to all of my global colleagues. Um, just to also say that um, there are members of the Caribbean Palliative Care Association who are here as well, and I just want to say good morning to everybody. Um, so in the next few minutes, I'm really hoping to share with you uh, what might be an approach um, to advocacy. Um, when we think about advocacy, we really think about being the voice um, to the voiceless, so to speak. But sometimes as, as physicians or maybe as academics even, we may um, find ourselves in a particular position where we feel like we're not competent um, to be advocates. We may feel like we are naturally trained to be in this position of equipoise where we're neither here nor there. But then um, we may have an internal emotional experience that catapults us into the realm of advocacy. And sometimes it's kind of difficult to navigate that. So what I wanna share with you is a possible framework for how we could position our advocacy efforts in the context of COVID-19. So we're gonna start off, uh, we're just gonna cover three things very, very briefly, perhaps maybe two minutes each. And I just wanna position it in the context of public health. So as Rob would have said, and as Catherine would have said, most of our governments, are, all of our governments have 
already made particular commitments that are directly aligned with the improvement of health for all, uh, the promotion of well-being, which fundamentally gets into the definition of what public health is. So I want us to leave here with a clear understanding that there's a direct synergy between public health approaches and palliative care approaches. And in terms of the crisis, this is essentially a global public health um, um, crisis that we're facing because of COVID-19. So we're gonna go on to the next slide where we're just gonna briefly talk about what has happened in the Caribbean. And basically I'm gonna advise that you can possibly use this simple, almost five point um, framework for mapping out your advocacy background as you approach the various stakeholders or power brokers in your region. So essentially the context is, you know, you set your geographic context with any needs assessment. So in the context of the Caribbean, we're talking about 16 million um, persons um, who would have been faced with the, the onset of imported uh, COVID cases. And there was a coordinated, I want to stress that, a coordinated public health response. And that public health response and key to the palliative care advocacy was a multi-sectoral coordinated um, response. So we can, we can almost lay the template of the fact that we're gonna have imported cases. We want to minimize local transmission within our country context. We're gonna need health services to achieve this. And most importantly, we know that most of the evidence that is emerging regarding those um, characteristics that indicate the likelihood for a poor um, COVID-19 outcome in terms of age, obesity, and some underlying NCDs almost directly um, links with the um, palliative care population. So as there is a massive movement by, by governments to shore, shore up their various public health responses, this is the time for us to show the synergies between um, the palliative care population and strive for integration. So you would notice there that in the Caribbean context, our last bullet on this particular side, it points out that we, we almost have the perfect storm. We have COVID imported cases, we have 16 million persons, we have perhaps some, fragile, some fragility in our healthcare system, aging populations, high NCDs, and lack of integration of palliative care. And if that scenario, that, that logic pathway suits you, you can build, think to build your advocacy framework using those fundamental bullet points as to why palliative care would mix or match with COVID-19 response. So next slide, please, sir. So the, some of us may be familiar with this, and this is a quick graphical summary of the WHO health systems approach. And I've just twisted it so that it becomes the health systems approach to advocacy because many of our regions without thinking about it, we may very well be using this in our COVID response. So the WHO health systems approach has basically six templates, um, six building blocks, they, they call them, where we look at the workforce, uh, we look at medicinal products and technology, service delivery, leadership and governance, social and healthcare funding, and more importantly, information and research. And when you look at what is happening in your country, I want to, to challenge you to think about what's happening with respect to COVID in these six domains and match these six domains to where palliative care needs um, may be useful. So there's going to be expansion of healthcare workforce in terms of maybe respiratory therapists, more nurses, ICU frameworks. There is a greater call for certain kinds of medicinal products, maybe even perhaps things like dexamethasone, which might be very useful for us. Um, and then there's also service delivery. So depending on where you are, there may be a, a segregation between isolation facilities, um, quarantine facilities, and what will happen to these facilities after they're no longer necessarily used um, in the COVID situation. So this is an opportunity for us to advocate, educate, lobby even in the context of medicinal products that may be necessary for palliative care, technologies that may be necessary that, and also diversification of service delivery. Now, in the Caribbean context, for some of us, a space has been opened um, to be at the table in terms of NCD responses for high-risk persons and persons with palliative care. And if you do have the opportunity or you can create that opportunity to be at the table, to, to speak to the needs of, 
of greater leadership and synergies between NCD policies and the incorporation of palliative care or chronic disease policies and the incorporation of palliative care. I want to encourage you to look at that second, that second bullet. And at least in the Caribbean context, because persons are off of work, um, there may be um, caregivers for persons who have high, high levels of need, et cetera. There has been an adjustment in the social health care funding system. And if that kind of adjustment is occurring as well, this may be a possibility where you can look for opportunities to advocate for the needs of persons who have uh, chronic life-threatening illnesses. And then finally, the WHO health systems approach um, to, to, to managing health systems, and we're tweaking it for advocacy today, speaks about the importance of information and research. And part of fundamental education about palliative care has to be the incorporation of information and research in terms of local context and regional context. And most governments right now um, in their public health responses, they're pouring money, quite frankly, into surveillance of, of COVID, understanding the progression of the disease, et cetera. And this is, this is exactly where we need to be positioning ourselves in terms of as research progresses related to COVID, to constantly identify the, um, the synergies. So this may be a possibility where you can finally get your uh, palliative care surveillance um, system up. This may be a possibility where you can shore up the surveillance and the research related to what's happening in elderly care homes. Uh, this may be a possibility for you to understand the survivorship experiences of persons who have, uh, who have um, palliative care needs. So I just want to encourage everyone as you advocate, also think about how can we get our research agenda um, fulfilled um, using this particular approach. And then finally, in my last um, couple seconds, I just want to say that a lot of the information or the communication strategies um, along COVID-19 have focused on what we will call non-pharmaceutical interventions to control COVID. So things related to social distancing, washing your hands, um, very generic messaging, being six feet apart, et cetera. But this is also an opportunity for us to get palliative care specific messaging um, into, into that communication. So as Catherine would have mentioned, there are multiple resources that we can go to and also um, through our communication systems with um, uh, our networks, make sure that if your government is putting out a guideline related to going back to work or opening of nursery schools or whatever it is related to social distancing, there's something there about protecting the vulnerable. There's something there that mentions the word palliative care and persons with palliative care needs. And then we're just onto our final slide and we're done until the Q&A. So I want us to think about the opportunities and in the Caribbean, we've had some opportunities to liaise with our university um, to have um, create regional dialogue through webinars. You can think about opportunities as Catherine would have mentioned as well for telemedicine, and, and also multimodal communication. So in essence, the primary messaging here is that COVID-19 is a public health issue. Palliative care is a public health issue. The populations that are at risk are the same. You can think about using a WHO framework to map out your six strategic points and look for direct synergies between the COVID response and where the palliative care response can fit from anywhere through to workforce allocation, all the way down to information and research. And I look forward to the Q&A and best of success to you in your various countries as you continue to address palliative care and COVID-19. Thank you. Thanks so much, Natalie, for your informative presentation with some really practical ideas of how we can um, advocate for palliative care during, during COVID-19. Um, I also noted, you know, when you said a space has been open to be at the table and um, a lot of us have faced many challenges um, getting to the table sometimes. So I think that's really um, interesting. Um, just to say, if people have any questions for any of the panellists, please type it into the chat box and they will be asked um, at the end of the session. So we're now moving on to our next speaker. Um, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Gulnara Konerova. 
um, who will speak on advocating for palliative care and access to pain treatment in, in Kazakhstan during COVID-19. Thank you, Gulnara. Hi. Uh, thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, everyone. I'm honored to deliver this presentation to you. Uh, this is a picture of Almaty. Uh, the, the picture was taken just a month before the coronavirus outbreak, when the step was blooming so beautifully. Can we have the first slide, please? Yeah, so the pandemic is challenging uh, our societies, our health systems, but it also is challenging our uh, road holding abilities as palliative care champions. Uh, we have to quickly adapt to the changing environment and uh, continue our advocacy efforts in line with the emerging exigencies. Um, and um, as it was said, Every challenge is an opportunity, and the pandemic, pandemic really helped us to generate a clearer and more focused vision of our ultimate goals and strategies to achieve them, um, and probably a better understanding of the needs of people whose interests we are representing. Next slide, please. Oh, um, mm -hmm. Since becoming independent in 1991, Kazakhstan has undertaken major efforts in reforming its post-Soviet health system. And with the recently uh, introduced mandatory uh, health insurance and other novelties, the main law regulating our healthcare system, the code on people's health, uh, is being currently amended. The previous version of the code mentioned palliative care as a complex of medical services aimed at improving the quality of life of patients and with incurable diseases in the terminal stage. And we considered this language insufficient and suggested a broader definition of palliative care, uh, which includes families and uh, uh, caregivers as beneficiaries and goes beyond medical services, incorporating psychological, uh, social, and spiritual support. And after almost year-long discussions with the ministry uh, and parliament members, we managed to introduce this definition to the code. Uh, but as we found out later, the final draft of the code contains an additional definition of palliative medicine which is meant for incurable patients in the absence um, of indications for radical treatment. And we uh, argued that this was just a paraphrase and this additional definition is limiting access to palliative care for patients still receiving a special treatment. Um, the ministry assured us that this language provides better opportunities for financing palliative care, uh, both from the so-called state guaranteed benefits package and the mandatory health insurance fund, while remaining free of charge for the patients. Um, it is unlikely that this definition will be changed uh, since the draft has been already approved by the Senate. However, based on the, these agreements with the ministry, we will make sure that to include as much of the language contained in the uh, consensus-based definition of palliative care developed by the IHPC in the substatutory decrees, including uh, the National Palliative Care Standard which will be revised soon. Next slide, please. Um, promoting adequate pain control. Can we have the next slide, please? Uh huh, Steven? 
um, pain control and access to opioids has always been, um, no, the previous slide, please. Uh -huh. One of our priorities. Yeah. yeah, can we have the previous slide? Yeah. It's access to Thank opioids you. quick response group is what's up. Uh, uh, uh huh, yeah. Um, because um, in spite of the latest improvements in this area, a lot of patients in Kazakhstan are still uh, experiencing unnecessary suffering. And based um, on the increasing number of complaints and calls from our patients, uh, especially those living in r remote or rural areas, uh, we made a post on Facebook regarding this uh, very alarming uh, situation with limited access to pain treatment. Um, since a lot of communication ha has moved to social media these days, and many people use Facebook for professional purposes, our decision makers suddenly became more reachable. Uh, so I tagged the minister and several ministry officials on the post, and the response was almost immediate. So the next day we had this first online discussion with the vice minister, several ministerial agencies, and provincial health departments, uh, which resulted in the creation of a quick response group with representatives from all 14 provinces of Kazakhstan and three big cities. So as a result, we um, decided to collect data from each province on planned, uh, purchased and consumed quantities of opioids. And the next slide um, uh, will show a little example of it. So what we did, we um, asked each of the 17 local health departments to provide quantities of all available forms of opioid analgesics uh, that were acquired in the beginning of the year, purchased from the uniform distributor and consumed during a certain period of time. Uh, and here you can see figures for the Kostanai pro province as an example. So we then calculated uh, these consumed amounts of ampules, tablets and patches uh, and um, to, um, so, and we translated them into a hypothetical number of people who would be treated with these amounts during one month. So for Kostanai region, this speculative number was 20 people only. Uh, and then we, uh, as a reference, we also took figures from the cancer registry and calculated 80% of cancer patients who died last year in this province. And we have sent this maybe not a very science-based uh, assessment to all health departments um, with our conclusions and suggestions. Next slide, please. And, um, then we had the third online meeting with the vice minister where we presented the results of our analysis. And we also anticipated the excuses on the part of local officials that primary care facilities who are responsible for prescribing opioids don't have enough knowledge or they are restricted by various documents. So we organized a series of free webinars on pain management and corresponding rules and regulations. So our first webinar was on June uh, 18. Uh, and each physician who will participate in all uh, eight webinars will pa and pass the final uh, exam will be given an electronic certificate. Um, one of our ministry agencies, the National Center for Electronic Healthcare, is currently integrating uh, numbers on acquisition and consumption of opioids into an electronic uh, report form, which will be submitted to the ministry on a monthly basis, uh, so that we will be able to track down the progress um, 
in opioid use by each province. So it, it all happened within one month. Next slide, please. And we can't um, overestimate the role of media for the success of our advocacy goals. Um, media gives us a wide range of opportunities from informing, uh, raising awareness to influencing and um, uh, decision makers and fundraising. It allows us to reach out to the wider society to increase the public demand for palliative care services. And we pay special attention to posting and publishing personal stories of, uh, with quotes from family members of those people who received proper palliative care because um, this way of presenting information increases page views and sharings multiply. And the rest of the slides um, just illustrate our activities directly addressing the urgent needs during the pandemic uh, by supporting patients in their homes, in quarantine facilities, by all possible means, um, be it personal protective equipment, oxygen concentrators, advice, psychological support, food, sanitizers, diapers. By doing all that, we are actually uh, are building trust and creating this public perception of palliative care as a listening, reacting, uh, empathetic, caring, and professional approach. And it adds truth and relevance to our advocacy efforts. So we have a hotline for public uh, free of charge. Uh, we have medical organizations uh, to fill the supply deficits. Um, and we also promote volunteer services and charity uh, to support hospices. Um, and the next slide will show, yes, these little projects. Uh, and then more supporting mobile teams is very important. Uh, supporting all caregivers uh, because the load on our mobile teams is increasing because more patients are now they have to stay at home uh, since more hospices are being closed for quarantine and we really need to support and protect them and thank you for your attention and when the pandemic is over I invite you to discover a beautiful and diverse ancient land which gave the world tulips, apples, domesticated horses, and the first manned space mission and other interesting things. Thank you. Thank you so much Gulnara for your excellent presentation which was really a fantastic case study of, of the briefing note really. Um, really talking about how you target and understand, know your decision maker, thinking of how to reach them through Facebook, what, what <laughs> methods, what are they listening to, what are they watching, um, having the data at hand, even if it's not perfect, having that data, um, and also using the media, but knowing why you're using the media and who you're using the media for um, and who you're targeting. So it was a really excellent presentation. Thank you. Tomorrow. Um, just to say in terms of questions, please, we're not actually using the raise hand option. So if you do have a question, please type it into the chat box. Um, so we're now going on to our final panelist. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Zipora Ali, who's the Executive Director of the Kenya Hospices and Palliative Care Association. And she will be speaking on the role of palliative care in COVID-19 pa pandemic in Kenya. Thanks, Zipora. Um, greetings everybody, uh, whether it's morning, evening or afternoon. Um, I'm really uh, uh, delighted to be on this uh, panel. I think we are all struggling, uh, listening to everybody, we are all struggling with similar problems across the world. COVID-19 has uh, really uh, caused a lot of uh, uncertainties everywhere. Next slide, please. 
So um, I'm not really going to start talking what about what uh, what political is all about, but I got this from the ebook that uh, Catherine mentioned, the one by Carella, that was developed by a number of uh, specialists, and I thought it really uh, brought out why we need palliative care in COVID-19. Some of the things that we are seeing that's happening with our patients in COVID-19 are the things that we have been seeing most in our, most of our cancer patients or uh, patients who need palliative care, people living with palliative care needs. That is the distressful symptoms that need to be managed, including pain and breathlessness, and also psychosocial support, emotional support, spiritual support for patients and their families as well. So really COVID-19 is a challenge, but there are people who can actually uh, deal with these challenges. And I think palliative care clinicians are very well placed to handle some of these challenges, working together with the other clinicians as well. So it's very important that we understand that palliative care should be an integral part of, uh, of COVID-19 response. And that's what we really need to advocate for in our country, that we should be part of the team that is responding to the current pandemic in our own countries. Because our interest is focusing on quality of life uh, for our patients, which is also quality of life for COVID-19. And we know most of our palliative care patients are the ones who are at high risk of COVID-19. So we really want to be part of this uh, system that's taking care of uh, the needs of, pallet, of, of, the, sort of the COVID patients in our country and be able to support the patients, their families, the healthcare workers providing these services as well. Because uh, we, this is something we have been doing over many this years as palliative care practitioners. So um, this is what we are trying to advocate for in Kenya, that we can actually be part of the team, we should be part of the team and use our skills and experience to be um, you know, part of this uh, team that is taking care of COVID-19 patients. Next slide, please. So we know that COVID-19, and I think it has been mentioned earlier on, has brought uh, you know, uh, quite a lot of uh, um, difficult, stressful situations for our patients and families. When somebody is diagnosed with COVID-19, they're taken into the hospital and separated from their families and they are alone in that hospital with the, with the healthcare workers, of course, but the healthcare workers are also very few and also very stressed with their jobs. And so they might not have the time they need to give to their patients. So we know our patients are facing isolation from their families, their friends. And we know that our families are going through a lot of stressful situations, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, because they cannot spend time with their loved ones. And especially if the patient is going to die and die alone, it's very difficult for family members. So these are some of the things we have been thinking in Kenya. How can we help address these issues? How, the, how can the palliative care practitioners in this country be part of this uh, you know, system that can actually uh, facilitate uh, communication uh, between families and patients, between healthcare workers, and all other people who might need support in terms of uh, being able to communicate with each other? The next slide, please. So um, what we did uh, when when we when when COVID nineteen when we had the first few cases in Kenya, uh, of course our government went into panic and formed some uh, subcommittees to deal with different issues of COVID nineteen. There was one formed on uh, clinical guidelines for COVID nineteen. They were now to uh, start uh, developing clinical guidelines. There was one formed for mental health and psychosocial support, and there was a one uh, formed specifically for non communicable diseases in and COVID nineteen. Now, this, when they formed these uh, different subcommittees, they did not involve any palliative care clinicians um, in the subcommittees. So when we got to hear there are subcommittees that are being formed and nobody has been invited from the palliative care community, uh, we wrote a letter to them. And this letter was just focusing on what palliative care is and how we can be part of the response to COVID-19. And the fact that for the past 10 years, we have been acting with our government to integrate palliative care into the public health care system and also into mission and, and private hospitals. We've actually managed to get to almost 40, 42 counties of the country um, have a palliative care unit within the county hospital. So the question was, how, what are we going to be doing with these clinicians in these counties if they're not part of this response? And so the government, when this letter went to them, they wrote, to, they, they actually called the next day and asked us how, how, the, how, how we would like to work with them. And we're able to say we'd like to help, be able to help develop the guidelines for uh, 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 the guidelines for managing symptoms, the guidelines for psychosocial support, and also work with NCD Alliance uh, to be able to reach out to patients who already have uh, life-threatening conditions and now are at higher risk of COVID-19. So again, we've been talking about advocacy, and I want to just mention that if you don't make the first move, it won't come to you. So this is something that we did ourselves because we realized we are going to be left out and we need to be part of this response. And so this letter actually sparked a lot of interest from the Ministry of Health, and we found ourselves in different hub committees uh, in dealing with COVID-19. Next slide, please. 
Next slide. Is that clear? So uh, maybe I'll talk about the different subcommittees as the next slides come on. We have the clinical guidelines subcommittee that is developing, that has developed draft or drafted uh, guidelines that keep on changing again as, as this disease is very, very new and a lot of things are being learned as time goes by, has managed to come up with case management, management guidelines. We're able to share with them the resources that Catherine talked about earlier on for managing uh, symptoms, you know, the mental, social, men, mental and, and psychosocial support guidelines, the ones for spiritual care. So these actually have been resourceful in developing guidelines within our own country. And so um, even for the NCD uh, 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 subcommittee, we have been able to uh, hold meetings with them and try to ensure that COVID-19, uh, palliative care is intervened to COVID-19, but also, of course, uh, remembering what Rob yet said, that it's also part of the universal health care cover package in our country. So we've been quite a lot of CMEs as a, as a, as a session. And the first CME on, on just trying to understand what people are going through, we had a CME for palliative care clinicians, and we just wanted to understand what COVID-19 means for them, what kind of things are they going through, you know, physically, emotionally. And so we had a lot of uh, interesting uh, conversations during that CME. And from that CME, we realized we need to do a survey and really find out what are the issues that people are facing. And these CMEs have been continuing almost every Wednesday, every week, except for the, we didn't hold one this week. And we've had different topics. We've had the topic on mental health and sexual support for people who have COVID-19 and their families. We've also had one on uh, mental health and sexual support for caregivers, that is clinicians working, palliative care clinicians working where COVID-19 patients are. We've also had one on uh, spiritual care by Father Reed. So these have been very engaging and we're able to really uh, learn a lot about um, uh, what we need to do and how we can support each other. We've had one on the use of PPEs and uh, uh, waste disposal because we were bringing in PPEs, but people did not really know how to use them very well. So we thought we should be able to give them that information. So there are many things that we are doing in terms of uh, uh, creating information on COVID-19 and, and, and trying to encourage our healthcare workers to be uh, aware of, of what's going on and also to, to, to take care of themselves so they don't uh, get burned out. The next slide, please. So we did a survey uh, that had about five, five to six questions. And what we did is we just looked at what had changed in terms of uh, service provision since COVID-19 and since we had a lockdown in the country. And there were quite a number of issues that were raised up. Most hospices were now seeing fewer patients. Some of them were not going to see patients because they felt they were at risk and the patients would be at risk if they were sick, they didn't have PPE. They had now to put uh, in place uh, hygiene, uh, uh, hand washing and sanitization uh, liquids. They had to start looking for, uh, for you know, uh, other ways they could reach their patients. And so, uh, and some of them were able to distribute medic medication for over one month or two months for patients so that patients don't make regular visits to the hospital. Mm -hmm. But there were quite a number of issues initially, especially for cancer patients receiving radiotherapy or chemotherapy who could not travel. Uh, our, our public hospital is the only one, there's only one machine, public machine in Nairobi, and people have to travel from wherever they are to come to Nairobi to get the radiotherapy. So even trying to get letters for patients to be able to travel because there was, a, there was restriction on traveling for them to be able to continue their treatment. All those things, we had to look at them. How can we support our patients to be able to continue accessing their treatment? And patients also had a lot of uh, challenges that they, they brought up in terms of uh, uh, COVID-19. Can you go to the next slide, please? So patients mostly talked about their fears uh, because of their pre-existing conditions. They were afraid they might not get their medications, their regular medications that they're provided for by the palliative care teams or the cancer center they're going to. They were afraid because of COVID-19. They had been told COVID-19 uh, is more, uh, it's, as patients with NCDs and other pre-existing conditions, they were at a higher risk. So they were scared to come to the centers. They were not coming. They were staying at home without medications. And then of course, there are the economic, and, uh, economic concerns and fears. Uh, some some of them uh, do small businesses, they're not able to do the businesses, and a lot of lock, uh, the lockdown, of course, meant that, that many people are not going to work. So there were the, the, the economic, social, <coughs> economic and, so, and social fears that the patients brought out. And so we were looking at how can we support some of these fears. We might not be able to give people money, but what can you do for us to at least ensure that uh, palliative care is provided uh, the, uh, to the patients who need it? So the next slide, please. Um, so we were lucky because we talked to some of our donors and initially we got some funding from uh, uh, global, uh, global Partners in Care, gave us some little funding and we bought some PPE initially 
that we provided to mostly the hospices that do home visits and have a high volume of patients to enable them to be able to go and see patients at home and also to enable them to continue having their, 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 their clinics, the outpatient clinics. So this was very helpful, but of course it was only for like five, five hospices only. We were lucky that we got in a second donor who gave us a quite a significant, significant amount of money, the True Colors Trust. And with this money, we were able to, uh, to purchase, and we are still purchasing even now, PPEs to be able to support uh, hospitals, government hospitals, mission hospitals, some private hospitals, and all the hospices in the country. So the last three weeks, we've been actually uh, distributing PPEs. As you can see from those pictures, different organizations receiving different rece receiving their PPEs. And we've had a lot of good response from this project. We are uh, hearing uh, our, our clinicians saying they can now be able to see the patients, they're able to do home visits. And these PPEs also, we have been giving them extra so they can give to the patient when they go and see a patient the patient is also protected so this has been a very um, a very useful project and i think one of the things we need to remember when you're doing advocacy is that we might be expecting our government to do everything but if you're coming from a resource limited country the government is not able to do everything so even as a civil societies we need to find out how can we support our government to be able to reach out to the uh, to the patients and to be able to reach out to those in need so we have a role also to play not just the government even as advocates we have a role to play in how what can we put into this to support uh, the system in, in terms of strengthening our healthcare system and making uh, services accessible to patients so like i said we did we have been distributing ppes apart from ppes one of the things we had of course uh, identified in the in our survey was the need to communicate with patients and so we have actually bought some smartphones uh, and these smartphones have been given to hospices. The reason we bought smartphones is because we want to be able to have, uh, the, the, for the clinicians to actually have a video call if necessary with the patients. Quite a number of homes in Kenya have a, a phone, at least a, even if it's a basic phone, and quite a number of young people in homes have smartphones. Since schools are closed, the young people are with their parents who might be sick. So we're able to facilitate, for example, uh, if somebody has a wound, a nurse can call and actually be, be, you know, be able to see the wound and then give advice if the patient is not able to come to the center. So the smartphones are not just for uh, uh, communicating with the patients, but also we hope we'll be able to, con uh, to continue um, uh, you know, collecting data that we need um, in terms of advocacy and policy in, uh, with, with our patients. So this, this has been very helpful. And like you see, we've been also having CMEs across the, uh, the country. Uh, next slide, please. So um, uh, these are just letters that have come from the various different places uh, that we've sent uh, the PPEs and funds from the hospitals, including uh, government hospitals, the hospices, the mission hospitals. And, and I'm just happy that at least we've been able to self, uh, support them to be able to continue to, to provide services to their patients and family members and to feel also confident and not at risk because I think it's important that the caregivers should also be comfortable if you are afraid of what's going to happen to you and your family and we have seen that most of them uh, when they go back into the estate uh, everybody's told keep the children away from those poor they work with COVID patients they will spread the disease so we want them to feel a little bit more confident and uh, and you know to be able to go and see their patients with more confidence next slide please Uh, so, okay, so uh, one of the things we've also done, uh, I think there's a slide that's missing, was to develop uh, um, materials um, that uh, give information to patients and to caregivers and healthcare providers. These are posters. Our posters usually uh, um, have to go through the um, health, health education department, the Ministry of Health, uh, so that they can actually uh, give us a, a green light to use the posters. And we have the logo of the Ministry of Health. We have our own logos. So we have been giving information also through posters to patients. For example, if you have a patient with a, a, a pre-existing condition who's receiving palliative care or treatment, uh, we have a, a poster that will inform people, uh, please do not visit, maybe come later on or just make a phone call because the patient, we have somebody who is uh, at high risk in the, in the home. So we've been also uh, distributing posters um, online and also physically to uh, to uh, our centers so that they can have the information they need and a lot of information on COVID-19 because one of the things that uh, uh, the healthcare providers complained about is we don't have education on, uh, on COVID-19 so we are also trying to see how can we continue giving more education on COVID-19 and uh, because it's a, it's a new disease and all of us are learning so it's, uh, we need to be able to have the right information and also of course um, direct people to the right resources we have so much information coming on especially on whatsapp that confuses people so we are trying to direct our healthcare providers 
to the resources that again Catherine talked about earlier on to get the right information on COVID-19 and what we need to do in terms of COVID-19. So um, one of the things we did again was to have our nurses and doctors uh, attend a training, an online training by the Red Cross and Ministry of Health on mental health and sexual support because um, there are these guidelines that have come out, the government has brought out on how we can support COVID-19 patients and we were part of the guideline development, but we also thought that we need our nurses and our clinicians to be trained specific on COVID-19 issues. And so we held a workshop, a one-day workshop, and we hope that we'll be able to hold more workshops so that all the people who are doing palliative care can be trained. But one of the things we are doing right now is developing training for healthcare providers that is going to be uh, tra a training for all people who are in the field right now on palliative care and COVID-19 because we, we really realize that people out there might not understand what palliative care is or have not been trained before, but they, they need to have these uh, skills, and, uh, skills and knowledge to be able to provide services for patients since our numbers are increasing we are now at 6,000 and above and counting every day. So it's very important that as we talk about advocacy, we have to talk about education also, and we also have to talk about human resource, human resources, thank you, and financial resources. Thank you. Thanks very much, Zippy, um, for outlining what's been happening in Kenya. And, um, you know, you were very quick off the mark to respond to the crisis with the survey. And it's just worth noting as well that, um, the work of Zippy and the Kenyan Hospice Palliative Care Association has led to palliative care morphine being included into the universal health coverage essential medicines over the last couple of months. So uh, congratulations to Zippy for securing what is going to be a, a longer term, um, a, a longer term success. Um, so we're now going to go on to our final um, that speaker who is going to give reflections on the topic and I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Susanna Ceruzzi um, from Argentina who is a bioethicist mm -hmm. and lawyer um, at the Dr. Juan Garahan Pediatric Hospital and she is herself a neurological patient. Thank you Susanna. Hi, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to, to share with you my own experience. Uh, sometimes I find that the best way to advocate for something is to advocate on you. And um, how, how does it feel to, to work in palliative care and be the, the patient for palliative care? Uh, I want to, to share with you that I suffered uh, mm -hmm. from a neurodegenerative disease uh, called Charcot syndrome and Frederick ataxia. Uh, since I was born, I could not walk until I was three years old. I just crawled with my butt. I alternated wheelchair, crutches, canes. I wear prosthetics on both legs. And... In those times, the doctors informed my parents that by the age of 30, I was probably going to be confined to a wheelchair and that my life expectancy was not going to exceed 50 years. Let me tell you, I'm 55 and counting. Uh, my disease also produced an hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. My heart works 25% with bradycardia, arrhythmias, and very low pressure. Uh, the first time a doctor showed me that I matter as a person and not only as a disease, I was a little girl, maybe five or six. Uh, I was at a hospital missing my little dog called Vienna. Uh, she was a small pure dog, a cheap copy of a Dachshund. And one day my mom bring Vienna to the hospital because this doctor allowed her to do it because he, he saw me that I was very, very sad. And another time, I, I remember a nurse who brought me chocolate ice cream once I was having a very painful procedure just because my mother told her that I love ice cream. I, I didn't have the opportunity to thank her so much. And when I was 12 years old, the younger sister of a classmate fell ill with leukemia. And I felt that I had to do something to stand by my friend. I didn't know what, I was a little girl, and I wanted to, to make her feel good and also at the same time respect her pain. 
uh, and at break time in school, I would buy croissants to share with my friend, and I would sit with her. Sometimes we spoke with words or with silence or with tears. And when her little sister Julia died, I asked my parents to go to the burial, and and I just melted into tears and hugs with my friend. And without knowing it, uh, I had found my vocation or maybe the vocation found me. And uh, I've been married for 25 years with my first and only love. And we met looking after a mutual friend, one of the first patients with HIV AIDS in my country. Mm -hmm. Our friend uh, died 20 days after we got married. And it was the second time that vocation knocked on my door. Uh, when I grew up, I had intensive care admissions. The first mm -hmm. time I had an allergic reaction to sulfur drugs and ended up with a multi-organ failure ready for a kidney transplant. I had lost all uh, the muscle mass and nobody knew if I was going to, to recover. And I learned two things. Uh, that doctors in intensive care do not like conscious patients and neither like music. At all costs, they wanted to sedate me, and I refused. I wanted to maintain self-control, make my own decisions, because I was not going to let life pass me by. And so I, I asked my, one of my friends to bring me a radio so I could listen to music and the news. And every day, just to know that I was keeping a certain degree of sanity, I recited a poem from my favorite poet, Federico Garcia Lorca, uh, or I repeated lyrics and music from a Beatles song. And there was this particular doctor who was always in a very bad mood, and he would systematically go into my room and turn off the radio. He told me that music was not allowed in intensive care, and so I decided to ask him what was the law that forbid that I could listen to music in intensive care. And he just slammed my door. The second intensive care admission was three years later, uh, an acute lung edema. My pulse at palliative care team were there to support me again because my treating physician at that time insisted that I was not a palliative patient because I was not to death yet and i remember that word very well not yet and the third hospitalization in intensive care was a result of more than eight hours of a surgery and i discovered that traumatologists do not handle sedation once again i needed my palliative care colleagues to sedate my pain a pain like i had never felt before in my life i have made an advanced medical directive for quite a long time which I, I updated now uh, with the issue of the pandemic. And although I had been confined for exactly 105 days for now, uh, I'm still a risk patient. Uh, I spoke to my clinical doctor and my surrogate, and then the most difficult moment came. I, I had to explain my, to my husband that if the devil stuck his tail in and I fell ill with COVID, I had no chance. It is already decided that I should not be admitted to intensive care nor put on a ventilator. Just let me enjoy the last moments at home with him and my, my dog, Ike. And to end this advocating, I did not choose palliative care because I know what suffering is or fear of illness or pain. I choose palliative care because uh, my own experience taught me um, that behind each patient, behind each medical record, there is a person, and that person needs comfort and care, and that each of us can make a difference. Um, I think that palliative care has undoubtedly made me a better person. Law school gave me knowledge, and palliative care gave me humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Susanna, for um, sharing your story. Um, it was really, it's really important to hear your words and we're really grateful for you joining us and speaking today. Um, 
we don't have too much time yet left, but we do have um, five or 10 minutes for questions. So I'm going to pass, um, pass over now to Kate uh, Jackson, who has been gathering the questions in the chat box. Kate. Thanks very much, Claire, um, and thank you everyone for the, the really interesting presentations and especially Susie for your reflections. That was really, um, you know, very moving. Um, the first question comes uh, from Malawi, um, and it's interesting because it's, it touches on a similar uh, situation of my, my home country in South Africa. Um, they say um, it's been more of a roller coaster in the country as far as opioid availability and access is concerned. One of the major challenges has been corruption. For example, central medical stores personnel selling the essential medicines to the private sector and even outside the country. So the question is, as the nation is attempting to root out such corrupt practices, what other options are available to palliative care institutions to navigate such troubled waters and to ensure that the individuals in need of this care and support have access to the medications they need and the care that they need? Lippi, do you want to take that question? Sorry, are you asking me? Uh, hey, could you repeat the question, please? Sure. Um, Zippy, the question is to do with um, how um, palliative care organizations can deal with um, a context of corruption. Um, so the question from Malawi was, um, as far as opioid availability and access is concerned, one of the major challenges has been corruption. For example, central medical stores, personnel selling the essential med medicines to the private sector. Um, so the question is, um, what options are available to palliative care institutions to navigate such troubled waters and to ensure that the individuals in need of the support have access? Okay, thank you very much for the question. That's a very tough question. <laughs> uh, but I want to first of all say congratulations to Malawi. They have a new president and uh, he's a president with a very good clean record. I hope that the corruption will now not happen anymore with the new president. For us, I'll just give a practical example. We, have, uh, we, we actually work with our, our Kenya Medical Supplies Agency. That is the one that supplies medicines to the public hospitals. And they also work with the, med, the one that supplies the meds, med supplies uh, mission. It's, it supplies to mostly missionary mission hospitals. So what we've done is we have, work, so we have working groups, technical working groups that uh, include the, um, the KEMSA people, the Kenya, Kenya Medical Supply Agency people in our in our, our working groups. And really, so we're able to tap on, to, to actually keep an eye on what's happening, especially on opioids. We work together, we actually have a task force that looks at opioids and the other uh, palliative care medicines. Mm -hmm. So we work collectively together. And I think this is a way of actually ensuring accountability. And so we are always on talking on WhatsApp. We always have a, hold a meeting at, at least every other two weeks or one month. Okay, now we're not holding so many meetings. When you have an opioid stock out, we are continuously talking to them. So I think you need to form, you need to form a task force where you have these people part of it so that they also feel responsible and uh, maybe reduce the, 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 the corruption. Corruption is very common in Africa. Unfortunately, we need to fight corruption um, in very many, many different ways. Yeah. Um, Claire, can I just jump in here? Do you? Yeah. Yeah, um, so one suggestion would be to make sure that morphine is on the um, essential medicines list and that there's gener generic non-proprietary formulations which aren't so expensive and wouldn't be so attractive um, for uh, the black market or the gray market. Um, I mean, that's one suggestion. And then I would just uh, channeling Bill Nara say to get in touch with the media to expose this. Uh, so there's, those are just a couple of suggestions there. Have the next question, please, Kate. Yeah. Sure. The next question, um, is to all panelists, has anyone been working with people living with palliative care needs to advocate for palliative care during the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes. 
Um, can I answer that one? So uh, in Kenya, we actually are working with the, we have a, um, what we call uh, patient champions. These are patients themselves. And some of them also, if their are their caregivers are part of the, the group of patient champions, we are actually working with them. Uh, two weeks ago, we held a half a day session with them on, online. And we brought in also the, the, uh, the lawyers who have been supporting us and advocating for patients' rights in palliative care. And we talked about issues of COVID-19 and how we'd like them to be the advocates within their own setups. And so we are following up with these patients. We are also trying to support them um, uh, financially to be able to, 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 to mm. buy airtime to, to take part in the meetings that are going on in different parts of the country, especially uh, if they are government meetings. So I think it's important that people living with palliative care needs are you know, part of the, the advocacy that we are doing. Others, um, I mean, we don't really understand what it is until we have it, so we need them to be, part, uh, to be on board and think we should include them. Nara, do you have anything to add to that question? I, I'm sorry, my connection is, I'm missing part, parts of the sentences. Okay, oh. no problem. No sorry. Problem. No problem. Um, Kate, would you like to go on to the next question? Um, sure. Can uh, the panelists comment on how to approach and advocate to our healthcare colleagues to convince them that we can support them, um, for example, with advanced care planning? Uh, when they finally refer the patients to palliative care, it is often too late. How can we advocate to them to make sure that patients are referred in time? Zippy, this might be a question for you again, I'm afraid. Sorry. Uh, I think um, one, one important thing is uh, education. Uh, and uh, what, what we are doing in Kenya, for example, we have worked with the training institutions, the, the, the universities and medicine and uh, nursing institutions to include palliative care into the core curriculum for healthcare providers so that when you graduate as a doctor or as a nurse, you have the basic basic um, you know, principles of palliative care, which include referral, understanding that you really need to refer a patient early. And we have uh, a lot of uh, um, training that, we, that goes on that actually talks, uh, um, you know, we try to target, we have what you call CME, so we go to, from county to county, we invite the doctors, institutions, we invite other, other, the nurses, the clinical officers on, a, you know, on an evening, and then we talk about palliative care. And what we focus on is a lot is, um, issues of referral because you're right as you're right to say patients the people wait until the last minute for the refer patients if they refer them at all so i think it's just about education uh, you have to do a lot of education especially for those already out in the field and were not trained in palliative care to understand um, about palliative care to have the idea what it is what it is about and then also to understand that it's also very beneficial for patients and for healthcare workers when a patient is referred early um, early when, when they've just had a diagnosis. So I think it's really a lot of advocacy and training that can help with that. Thank you, Zippy. I think we have time for one more question, Kate, if there's any qu more questions. Um, we've got a question um, asking, can the panelists advise on their most effective strategies for getting to the table to advocate for palliative care? I think I'll, I'll just give that one a shot. I see Rob le leaning in as well. So I'll be, I'll be very brief. Um, so us in the Caribbean and certainly in Barbados, uh, what has worked was the aspect of volunteering at the policy level to assist with writing of policies, uh, particularly related to um, cancer care, um, NCD care, and um, just basically volunteering expertise. I think the, that kind of, um, altruistic approach um, has, 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 really, uh, has really worked. And, and then essentially engage in a way that for us is, is respectful and, and, and facilitating of continuous dialogue. Also um, pointing out to the um, national policymakers opportunities for where when palliative care services are increased, it's, it can work synergistically with other aspects of their healthcare programming. That to achieve. So for sure, um, volunteering technical expertise, advisory expertise uh, has been extremely useful 
for, for, for us. Thank you, Natalie. Rob, would you like to come in? And if I may, I, I suppose one suggestion is that one is often faced with a choice in sort of doing advocacy and lobbying. You know, do you go for the, uh, the technocrats, the civil servants, or, or do you go for the politicians? And my advice is very much go for the politicians, you know, because at the end of the day, that you know, they set the priorities. And, and I think in presenting the case to the politicians, there's, there's often a tendency to state the problems and you know go in with lots of negative messaging but but i think what really gets politicians excited is if that yeah sure present the problem to them but but then suggest solutions to them and then very much present to them that sorting those problems out will make them look good and will add to their popularity and, and i think you might be sort of therefore sort of flattering the politicians but at the end of the day that's what they like so very much put yourself in the position of the politicians and if you can make it look to them that they're going to come out of this looking as heroes, then you're much more likely to get what you want. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Um, thank you, Natalie. Well, thanks, everybody, um, for uh, joining this webinar. And thank you so much to all the speakers. Um, we're just going to, I'm just going to hand over to Julia Downing now, who is going to talk about um, the webinar that is taking place next week. Um, Julia. Thank you Claire. Yes, next week we have got um, a webinar which is looking in particular at three specific vulnerable groups um, and how uh, we can uh, ensure that they get adequate care um, throughout this COVID pandemic and those three groups will be the um, LGBT plus community um, or people, um, the uh, prisoners and the homeless. So we're going to have three speakers each talking um, about one of those and uh, we hope that our briefing notes will be published um, prior to that. So that's next week. So please do join us for that. Thank you, Julia. So uh, just to remind everybody, the briefing note is available on the globalpalliativecare.org website. Um, and I hope from this webinar you will take away a feeling of solidarity and um, support and some ideas for how to uh, support your own advocacy at the national level. And to know that there are people here, presenters um, on this uh, webinar, but also others who are here to help. So thank you everyone for joining today. Thank you so much for our speakers, Catherine, Rob, Natalie, Bulnara, Zippy, and thank you so much to Susanna for sharing her story. Um, Excellent presentations. Thank you and stay safe and well. Bye. Bye all.